Welcome to Leveraging Inspiration, the Inspired Patent Podcast, where we help you understand and leverage your intellectual property. I'm your host, Wayne Carroll. I'm joined here with Scott Gibson, and we're excited to bring you insights and stories. We're talking about trade secrets today and how trade secrets are part of your essential intellectual property. So before we get started, I always have a disclaimer. The information I provide on this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. I am not providing legal advice, nothing in this podcast podcast should be construed as creating an attorney-client relationship. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you, Wayne. We're going to go ahead and talk about the do's and don'ts for non-disclosure agreements and employee agreements. I actually talked to uh, an engineer a few years ago, and he worked for a company for several years and then was presented with a very broad restrictive agreement with confidentiality and non-compete clauses. The engineer was being pressured, but she decided she didn't want to sign. She decided she could do a better job at running the company than her current employer. She didn't have a great feeling about that employers, especially after they said, here's this, you have to sign it. She left and successfully started a competing business. Does this happen a lot or is this a one-off person that I met? It, it's not uncommon. Usually people don't take proper steps until it's too late proper steps to protect their trade secrets and other confidential information. My mantra is you want to do this early and often and make sure that from the very beginning, and I, I've got a whole uh, classroom lecture that talks about how you have people sign restrictive covenants and when you want to get them to do it. And short version is well, that should be part of our interview before I offer you the job. When I tell you this is what I was going to be expected of you. Okay. And if you're consulting with an employer who's in that position where they realize, you know what, we've got some secrets we, we really want to keep. Do you guide people through how to try to put the cat back in the bag? <laughs> well, in, unless they have disclosed information, there's always an argument that we've made maintain steps to protect the secrecy of the information. So for example, if you're an engineer and I have to show you the recipe for the secret sauce so that you can do your work, uh, you have a duty of loyalty to me that uh, exists regardless of whether you have a contract, regardless of whether there's anything in writing. You aren't allowed to you to exploit my trade secrets. And if the, you've only had access to my trade secrets so that you could do your job, I, as the employer, still have some protections against your using that, even in the absence of a written agreement. Now, I would counsel you, get that agreement, get it in writing, get it early, and uh, maintain a review and update that from, from time to time. But let's talk specifically about what information you have that is protected and want to make sure that, uh, that you maintain confidential. Okay. A lot of inventors that haven't really started a company come to me. You know, they're going to do a startup and I, I talk to them about what that's going to take. It's not an easy road and there's plenty of risks. I only discourage a few of them. A lot of them still go forward. Um, but they say, okay, well, I'm going to show this to some people. I just need an NDA, right? Yeah. Well, again, let's go back to what are we covering? Right. Let's start there. And then we need, there, there's no such thing as an off-the-shelf NDA. There may be a draft document that you use as a starting point, uh, but you're going to want to add and subtract things from that to fit your particular situation. One of the biggest problems we have with uh, agreements to protect confidential information or restrictive covenants, a non-compete or a non-solicit agreement, the big problem is that they're too broad. They cover mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, including uh, I've seen them where they they prohibit people from uh, doing selling products when the company only does services, has no products to sell. You need you do not want an off the shelf uh, agreement. You want one that is tailored for your business specifically. What happens if you've got an agreement that's you know, talking about DNA sequences when, you know, you're, you're selling toys and, you know, consulting services and <laughs> what, what happens is, does it basically fall apart in court pretty quickly or? 
Is that what happens? It, it creates all kinds of problems. Uh, it ends up costing you tens of thousands of dollars more to likely get a lousy result at the end of the day. Your agreement needs to be narrow and tailored and specific for your business. Now, the problem is, as lawyers, we tend to be paranoid. And so we're afraid that if we don't include something, that somehow our client's going to lose the case and it'll be our fault. So we include things that uh, beyond what we should. Uh, if your lawyer is really watching out for you, she'll specifically identify your secret sauce and draft an agreement that is specifically limited to that secret sauce so that you can go into the court and tell the judge with a clear conscience, all we want to do is protect our one thing that is the most valuable asset that we have. And the, the specificity works in your favor in that regard. Okay. So rather than going in and saying any information they ever saw or touched or tasted, <laughs> they 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 need to not use it, including every email they sent or received, and their browsing history, even if it included cat videos. Yeah. And because it's ridiculous that any of that would have any value. How is the cat video help your business? And I can <laughs> think of one or two where it might, but if I'm an engineer, cat videos probably don't get me anywhere. Overbroad agreements get struck down. Judges don't like them. That's why you want to be narrow and specific and focused on what you're protecting. So it sounds like and we were talking in the, the last episode about branding your trade secret. When you go to court, are you in essence trying to sell the court on that you have a trade secret? Yeah. If it's not a thing, then why are you in the court? The judge has to understand that it is a thing, that it's real. It exists. Uh, in a related case that I had a number of years ago, we went in to get a, a preliminary injunction against a woman who had, we were trying to prevent her from competing in a particular area. And my witness was the vice president of marketing for this uh, national company who came in and marvelously explained why this big notebook of stuff of marketing information we had was a trade secret and why we needed to make, keep it confidential. There was something specific that she could, that we took into court and we showed the judge, see, here it is. It's a real thing. And here's why it's valuable. And here's the meaning. You need to do that before the bad guy walks out the door with your trade secret. You need to be able to do that from the get-go so that you can explain that in the unlikely or the, the event that you hope will never happen where you have to go into court to enforce an agreement. Right. And are there, are there a lot of cases that you can resolve without actually ending up in court? Yes, most of them do. Um, but these are also cases that can be extremely expensive from the beginning uh, because you typically go in and ask the court to issue an injunction, which means you're having a hearing on the first day the case was filed or shortly afterwards. Can they be resolved? Yes. Frankly, the more specific you've been in identifying and specifying your your trade secrets, the more likely you are to, to be able to get a re, re, an informal resolution. Okay, yeah. Are, are uh, restrictive covenants, which includes non-disclosure agreements and the employee agreements, vendor agreements, are those generally harder to enforce than general contracts? Absolutely. Uh, right now, there is a... Uh, really a nationwide effort against uh, restrictive covenants, particularly non-compete agreements. But uh, President Biden has uh, directed the FTC to issue regulations regarding uh, non-compete agreements. Uh, they've prepared some draft rules. Uh, there's been a lot of comments that go on. 
Uh, I was part of a group that commented on that. And uh, we anticipate that sometime this summer, they're gonna issue the final rules and then uh, we'll probably be in court litigating that. But as a general rule, those agreements are disfavored in the law, which again is another reason why we come back to be specific, narrow, and focused in what it is you're trying to restrict. Okay. In 2016, Congress passed the a trade secret national or federal trade secret act and the Fed trade secrets act. Yes. Yes. Did that change things very much or did it kind of just solidify what was already there? The Defend Trade Secrets Act incorporates a lot of the definitions that were part of the Uniform Trade Secret Act, which most states have adopted in one version or another. The big difference with the Defend Trade Secrets Act is that it has criminal liability in some instances, and there's also a, uh, a sequestration uh, order where you can grab offending products uh, in certain circumstances. It's still new, it's still being litigated, it's still being tested, but it is. it provides a second method or an alternative method for protecting a company's trade secrets. Yeah, the first 10 years of any law is usually the, uh, we're not sure exactly where the edges of this law is. And Sometimes you get towards the end of that 10 years, a Supreme Court case that defines one piece of it. But yes, laws are very slow to be defined. <laughs> so we are almost out of time. What are action steps that companies need to take with employees? Can you give me a 10 second, 20 second? <laughs> of, of what you need to do. You need to make sure your employees know what your trade secrets are. Again, uh, and explain to them why, uh, why they're important. And it might go something like this. Hey, everybody, I know you like to get a paycheck every week. The reason we're able to give you a paycheck is because we have this secret sauce that makes us special. It makes customers willing to give us large sums of money so that we can pay you. We need you to help us maintain the secrecy of that information. I think intentional and deliberate and specific discussions help your employees know what to do and frankly uh, gives them the opportunity to let you know if something untoward is going. Okay. Well, thank you for that. We'll be back in just a minute. Um, this is Wayne Carroll. I'm joined with Scott Gibson on Leveraging Inspiration.